The word Jurassic conjures up a picture of life on a large scale, with large dinosaurs roaming the land, huge reptiles surging across the sea, and flying reptiles soaring the air. The oceans teemed with new predators, including ammonites, belemnites and a range of shell-crushing fish. On a much smaller scale, the plankton were evolving and changing ocean chemistry. Plate movement continued to reshape continents and widen oceans during the Jurassic period, the separation of the northern and southern parts of the supercontinent Pangaea that began during the Triassic continued during the early Jurassic, enlarging the Tethys Ocean. This ran in an east-west direction, which had a significant effect on ocean flora and fauna, and on the world's climate. Global climates were warm and humid, with temperatures to up to 30 degrees Celsius until the Middle Jurassic. Subtropical climates may have extended as far north as 60 degrees latitude, the northern hemisphere became drier during the Jurassic due to breakdown of monsoonal circulation that had been well established in the early Jurassic. Global temperatures declined during the late Jurassic, with relatively cool oceanic temperatures, pronounced seasonality, where temperatures swing from extremes of heat in summer to very cold in winter, was a feature of the late Jurassic. In the wetter regions, forests that consisted primarily of conifers laid down extensive coal deposits. Mid to high latitude floras were dominated by ginkgo like plants and ferns, as well as conifers. Cycads were the main plants in low latitudes. Following the late Triassic extinctions, marine invertebrate life proliferated and diversified greatly as new ecosystems arose in the warm seas. An overall greenhouse climate prevailed, and on land there were rich forest, and also dinosaurs, flying reptiles, and the first birds. Typical of the Jurassic are the ammonites. These were the last group of ammonoids to evolve and they displayed a characteristic complex suture. They spread out and diversified rapidly, genera or whole groups succeeding one another, often with a turnover rate of less than a million years. Belemnites were important in the Jurassic, lobster-like CR. Eustachians became more common in some habitats, in places large sponge reefs grew, although there were no true coral reef yet. The presence of large fish and marine reptiles gave a new dimension to Jurassic marine life, in contrast to that of the Carboniferous, for example, in the face of this increased predation, many groups of echinoids and bivalves adopted the strategy of burrowing into the sediment for protection. Peronidella was a calcareous sponge, characterized by a skeleton composed of calcium carbonate spicules that were needle-like and fused together. The rigid structure created by the spicules was cylindrical, and in most species, it was also branched. In life, this sponge would have fed and breathed by drawing seawater in through pores in the outer body wall, which then passed into its central cavity. As the seawater passed through the thick body walls of the sponge, oxygen was absorbed and food particles were filtered out. The Cosmelia was a scleraction coral that consisted of numerous loosely packed, cylindrical individual polyp skeletons. Extra coralites were formed by a process called asexual budding, in which offspring of the soft-bodied polyps grew out of the body of the parent. This process created more branches and increased the width of the colony. The outer wall of some of the fossilized coralites shows growth increments, but this has often worn away. Thamnisteria was a scleractinian coral that would have lived in warm, shallow seas. It was composed of individual polygonal coralites that were closely packed together, or serioid, bivalves have bored into the coral skeleton shown below, leaving a number of sediment-filled cavities. Isastria was a colonial coral that belonged to a group called the hexacorals, so-called because of the hexagonal shape of their polyp skeletons. Its coralites were closely packed together and the walls of the adjacent coralites were fused together. An arrangement referred to as serioid, the walls that divided up the inside of the coralites were slender and tightly spaced. It was a hermatypic coral, which meant that it formed reefs. Hermatypic corals need warm, clear, shallow water and live in symbiotic relationships with microscopic algae, which use carbon dioxide produced by T. Coral to photosynthesize and provide oxygen for the coral. 
Early Jurassic forms of Spiriferina were the last survivors of the order Spiriferida which first appeared in Silurian times a long straight hinge line connected the valves which were strongly patterned with four to seven well-marked ribs that were more prominent toward the outer edge a strong fold in the center of the smaller valve corresponded with an equally strong infold on the larger valve examination under a magnifying glass reveals that Spiriferina's shell was perorated by minute pores. This unusually shaped brachiopod belonged to the Rhynchonellids. Other members of this group usually had strongly ribbed shells, but Homeorhynchia was characterized by its smooth shell surfaces, the brachial valve, and its pointed end or beak were more prominent than the pedicle valve, which had a small opening for the pedically fleshy stalk that attached the organism to the seabed. The center of the brachial valve had a very strong fold that corresponded with an equally strong infold that ran down the center of the pedicle valve. Antrophoceras was a tightly coiled nautiloid whose outer whorls almost enveloped its inner whorls it had a small and deep central part to the shell and is therefore described as involute the shell was almost spherical and the whorl sections were kidney shaped inside the shelled siphuncle a tube of tissue that connected the inner chambers was small in diameter and positioned roughly in the center the suture lines where the septa joined the shell were simple and fairly straight but otherwise the shell was quite plain apart from some fine growth lines. Stephanoceros was a round whorled ammonite, it had thick strong ribs that radiated from the inner side of the whorl and ended in tubercles or bumps in the center they were found to occur in two sizes. Reek time equals, 0.4 s, greater than often, the smaller one of the two had or like projections, called lappets, on either side of the shell opening. Dactyloceros was a heavily ribbed ammonite, with whorls that barely overlapped each other, this produced a wide and shallow central part of the shell. Ammonites with this kind of whorl and umbilicus configuration are referred to as evolute. The shell had sharp, radial ribs that were dense on the inner whorls and gradually became more widely spaced on the outer whorls. Ammonite fossils are abundant in some parts of northwest Europe. In medieval times people believed that these rocks were snakes that had been turned to stone and called them snake stones. The cephalopod Phyloceras first appeared in the early Jurassic and changed very little until the early Cretaceous. The coiling in Phyloceras was extremely tight. Its whorls almost covered each other. This created a small, deep center or umbilicus. The outside of the animal's shell was almost smooth, but it had a large number of very fine, densely packed radial ribs that only slightly affected shell thickness. It would have lived mainly in open seas, but made occasional forays into shallowed water. Lytoceras had round to square, barely overlapping whorls and a wide, open, navel-like umbilicus, the shell's fine, close ribs gave it a crinkled appearance, where sharper ribs occurred, the shell was stronger and constructed inside, it lived mainly in deep, open seas, only sometimes moving into shallower water. Cylindrotethys was a large belemnite and is a common fossil in many Jurassic localities, the part of a belemnite most frequently preserved is its pointed guard, which was made of calcite and acted as a stiffening structure for the animal's squid-like body. Some fossils show traces of blood vessels on the outside of the guard, which indicate that it was an internal feature. A conical depression in the guard's blunt end housed the framicone, a kind of internal, chambered shell that helped cylindrotuthus regulate its buoyancy. Griffia was an asymmetrical member of the oyster family, its left valve was large and outwardly curved, providing stability on the seabed, the right valve was flat or schlee. GHTLY concave, and acted as a lid, a ligament controlled the opening of the cell, while a single, strong adductor muscle closed the valves by contracting. Pleuromia was a medium-sized bivalve with two valves of equal size, at the rear end was a permanent gape through which two siphons protruded, it lived buried in seabed sediment, drawing in food through its inhalant siphon and expelling waste through its exhalant siphon. Myophorella was a wedge-shaped bivalve with a distinct shell pattern, behind its two beaks lay the short ligament that was responsible for opening the valves, the ligament ran along a flat, lozenge-shaped section on both valves, which was smoother than the rest of the shell, and had three rows of small bumps on each valve. On the main surface of the shell were rows of much larger, irregular tubercles. Medialis has adapted to a range of environments, and survives today, 
The beaks of its shells are to the front, and the shell surface has fine growth lines on it, in some species these become heavier ribs, it attaches to the seabed by abyssus, horny threads often called a beard on mussels. Pleurotomaria was a conical gastropod, the center of its shell was smooth, but it developed a strong ornament consisting of combinations of spiral and radial patterns, around the side of the whorl is the slit band, a groove that continues around the shell to a slit in its opening that separates the waste carrying exhalant current from the inhalant current, the animal could withdraw into its shell and close off the opening with a horny lid called an operculum. The crinoid pentacrinites is often found in Jurassic rocks in the form of isolated pentagonal stem segments, called ossicles. The small cup is often hidden by the abundant side branches, called cirri, that grow from the stems. The cup was made of circles of regularly arranged plates and roofed by a domed membrane, the tegmen, which incorporated a number of small calcite plates, pentacri. Knights is often found with fossil wood, so it has been suggested that this crinoid attached itself to floating wood and died when the wood became waterlogged and sank, a mode of life known as pseudoplanktonic. The crinoid apiacrinites had a large cup, its long stem was made up of individual segments called ossicles, and the cup was made up of two rings, each with five plates, Above these were rows of arm plates, from which arose ten arms used for gathering food, it attached itself to hard surfaces in clear warm water. Like all brittle stars, Paleocoma's body opening were located on the lower surface of its flat disc-like body, these included a central, star-shaped mouth that also served as the anus, the opening into the water vascular system, and five pairs of gill slits found on either side of each arm near the disc's out edge. In addition to being used for respiration, the gill slits acted as release points for eggs or sperm. Food grooves with tiny, muscular tube feet ran along the underside of the arms and led to the mouth. The tube feet brought food toward the mouth and helped the organism move. Pentasteria was a typical Jurassic asteroid or starfish, and in most respects, it differed little starfish alive today. Like them, it had a double row of tube feet along the underside of each arm which it used to move along, and its mouth was positioned on its underside in the center of its body. Unlike many modern starfish, it lacked suction discs on its tube feet, so it was unable to use them to pry open closed bivalve shells. Clypeus was a large, flattened sea urchin. On its upper surface, the ambulacra were shaped like petals, in the center lay the apical disc, with four genital plates that contained pores for the release of eggs or sperm. Its anal opening was in a groove at the rear of the upper surface, the mouth was located in the center of the lower surface, the ambulacra on this side had large pores, and a single tube foot protruded through each pair of these, the tube feet were used for respiration, feeding and locomotion, including burrowing. Shaped like a flattened sphere, Hemicidaris was a medium-sized sea urchin, the most notice. Able feature of this species are the large bumps that ran along the body. In life, these tubercles carried large, tapering spines up to 8 cm long. The sockets found at the end of the spines fitted onto the ball-shaped ends of the tubercles, and the muscles that moved the spines were attached to the relatively smooth area around these tubercle end points. It would have lived on firm seabeds and used the sticky tube feet on its lower surface for locomotion as well as for feeding. Libellulium was a large, prehistoric dragonfly. Like modern dragonflies, its head had large, bulging eyes located at the front, its thorax was short, expanding slightly immediately behind the head. The abdomen was composed of seven or eight long, narrow segments, with visible divisions between them. The limbs were situated at the front end of the thorax. The long, narrow, powerful paired wings originated from the thorax at the front end of the animal. The forewings were a little narrower and slightly longer than the hind wings, which slightly overlapped them. Some of the fine venation of the wings, including major and secondary veins, can readily be seen. Dragonflies have a long geological history. The earliest appeared during the Carboniferous period. The prehistoric horseshoe crab Mesolimulus was very similar to today's species. The large headshield was horseshoe-shaped, and its eyes small and compound. 
the abdomen was covered by a single, semi-oval plate with a narrow, raised area flanked by raised lobes, its broad marginal area was flat, and adorned on either side by seven long, pointed spines. A long, sharp pointed barb or telson arose from the back of the abdomen. Arima was a lobster, its hard, upper shell at the body's front end had a broadly oval outline and a prominent, backward curved groove in the area between the front limbs or chelipeds, which ended in large, lozenge-shaped pincers. Each pincer had an inner movable finger and an outer rigidly attached one. There were four more long, slender, delicate walking limbs. Behind the carapace, the abdomen was narrower and composed of five broad segments, it terminated in the tail fan, made up of five radiating flat lobes. The major subgroups of dinosaurs, the rop-odd sauropodomorphs and ornithischians, originated during the late Triassic however for the first 30 million years of their history dinosaurs were only supporting actors on the world stage and in many ecosystems were outnumbered and outmuscled by cruritarsons very suddenly about 200 million years ago cruritarsons except for the crocodilomorphs disappeared in the midst of a global environmental meltdown as volcanoes spewed toxic gas into the atmosphere and temperatures skyrocketed this extinction was one of the big five mass extinctions in Earth's history and without it dinosaurs might have never risen to dominance. Crocodilomorpha is the technical term for living crocodiles and alligators and their closest fossil kin this remarkably successful group is the only surviving remnant of the great Cruritarsan radiation of the late Triassic when crocodile line archosaurs dominated ecosystems around the globe true crocodilomorphs evolved in the late Triassic alongside their Cruritarsan cousins these proto-crocodiles looked nothing like the crocodile of today but instead were small slender animals that walked upright and could run at high speeds. The Middle and Late Jurassic are often referred to as the Age of Dinosaur Giants this fitting description pays homage to the evolution of several remarkable groups of colossal dinosaurs which dominated terrestrial ecosystems across the planet foremost among these giants were the long-necked and plant-guzzling sauropods the Late Jurassic was the peak of sauropod evolution. The skeleton of Hybotus was very robust and more densely calcified than that of modern shark. The jaws were solid and armed with rows of teeth that were continuously being replaced as in modern sharks in contrast to living sharks in which the mouth opens on the underside of the head. Its mouth opened at the end of the snout in addition to pelvic claspers used to insert sperm directly into the female. A male Hybotus also had specialized spines in the soft tissues of its head. These may have helped the male grip the female during mating. One or two pairs of these spines were situated just behind the eye. Fish similar to Ischiotis are today restricted to the deep oceans, but in its time it was a common bottom dweller. It had a mainly cartilaginous skeleton, large eyes, pectoral fins, and a long whip-like tail. The first dorsal fin had a prominent spine that could be raised, and was probably used for defense. Instead of teeth, it had dental plates that often protruded from its mouth. This is where it gets its common name, rabbitfish. There were two pairs of plates in the upper jaw, and one pair in the lower jaw. They were used to crush mollusk shells and crustaceans. Dental plates are the most commonly preserved part of this fish, and are used to distinguish different species. Possibly the largest fish that ever lived, Leedsethus was first discovered near Peterborough, in 1886. Despite its formidable size, it was a harmless filter feeder, its huge mouth could take a large volume of water in a single gulp, it then sifted microorganisms from the seawater with gill rakers, or mesh plates at the back of its mouth, just as basking shark and baleen whales do today. It is classified with the pachycormids, fish that have partly calcified skeletons. Because cartilage does not fossilize well, the lack of calcification means that many of its bones have not been preserved and others are so thin that they are easily crushed. Teeth, however, are more robust than bones, and it has been possible to estimate that Leedsethus had more than 40,000 of them. Although one of the commonest fossil fish, specimens of Leptolepides are often damaged, making them difficult to study. This is possibly the reason that it was not recognized as being distinct from the very similar Leptolepis until 1974. Leptolepides was a primitive bony fish that lived in shoals in shallow water lagoons. 
It had a somewhat elongated body with a depth about one-sixth of its length, the single dorsal fin was relatively long and the tail fin was deeply forked. Only three fossilized skeletons of this small frog have ever been found, they w. Air discovered in Arizona in the 1990s, and are the earliest frog skeletons to show the full set of jumping adaptations that characterize frogs today. These include long hip bones, long hind leg bones, and long ankle bones. Earlier ancestral frogs had been found in Madagascar and Poland, but these examples still had tails and did not have jumping adaptations, so they would not have been capable of frog-like leaping movements. Frog began to diversify long after Procellaris had died out, so it is not directly related to any one modern family. All the fossils were found in one small area, which probably represented the last puddle of water on a dried-up flood plain. This small, burrowing amphibian was discovered in Arizona. It had a small head with heavy internal armor, a very long body, four tiny limbs and a short tail. The skull of Eocecilia is very like those of the group of living amphibians called Cecilians. It is believed to be the earliest known member of this group. Modern-day Cecilians are burrowing creatures that have lost their limbs altogether. The only fossil of Caroras was discovered in the 1970s in a fossil lake bed in Kazakhstan. For some years it was the earliest salamander known. It was a medium-sized salamander, and is very heavily built with a broad, frog-like skull, a short body, and large legs. It was more primitive in many of its skeletal features than any living salamander, which has led scientists to believe that modern-day salamanders evolved from an animal that was more advanced than Caroras. K. Anticellis was one of the oldest turtles, and an important link between primitive Triassic turtles and modern turtles. Like all modern turtles, it was sheathed in a box-like shell comprised of a carapace on top and a plastron underneath. Its skull was short and wide and was capped with a sharp beak. It lived in southwestern North America, alongside dinosaurs and early crocodilomorphs and turtles gave this ecosystem a modern character, in comparison with ecosystem of the middle to late Triassic. New Zealand's two Tuatara species are the only living mem. Burrs of the once diverse reptile order known as Phenodontia perhaps the most unique of these animals Plurosaurus was slender and streamlined with a long tail its hands and feet were modified into paddles enabling its maneuvers as it chased small fish. Plesiosaurus was a large marine reptile that lived in the shallow seas of what is now Europe during the early Jurassic about 190 million years ago in many ways it looked like an aquatic version of a dinosaur however it was only distantly related to the dinosaurs and was more closely related to lizards and snakes it was a typical plesiosaur with a stocky torso for large flippers and extremely long neck and a tiny skull filled with many small teeth this combination of features allowed plesiosaurus to dominate its marine ecosystem it was a highly successful predator of fish squid and other relatively small fast moving prey plesiosaurus was a fast and powerful swimmer that could strike at schools of fish with great speed using its muscular neck Liaplorodon was the apex predator of Europe's seas during the middle to late Jurassic. This monstrous reptile reached lengths of 10 meters making it larger than a modern-day killer whale. It was a plesiosaur a stout-chested carnivorous marine reptile. Most plesiosaur were long-necked and fed on fish. How Vir Leoplorodon was one of the pliosaurids a subset of fearsome predatory plesiosaurs with shorter necks and larger heads like other pliosaurids. It used its powerful jaws which were up to one. 5 meters long and studded with conical teethed spear marine reptiles and large fish although hefti its body was streamlined and it used its four paddle-like limbs to drive itself through the water Liaplorodon was an amazingly successful animal it existed for around 10 million years and inhabited a wide belt of seas across all of ancient Europe. first glance ichthyosaurus looks rather like a dolphin or a fish but it was a reptile closely related to lizards time equals 0.4 s greater than its streamlined body was designed for speed with hands and feet modified into flippers a dorsal fin and a tall paddle-like tail 
Ichthyosaurus's skull was adapted for hunting fast-moving, slippery prey. It was elongated and studded with rows of sharp teeth. Stenopterygius was a close relative of Ichthyosaurus. Like its more famous cousin, it was a dolphin-like reptile that hunted schools of fish in the warm, shallow seas of Jurassic Europe. It grew to a slightly larger size than Ichthyosaurus but had a smaller skull, which was perfectly adapted for quickly striking, capturing, killing and eating fish. Stenopterygius's snout had the streamlined profile of a missile or submarine, and it could blast through the water like a projectile, rapidly striking fish with little or no warning. This creature's tail was also adapted for speed. The vertebral column in the tail bent downward and supported a deep tail fin, similar to those seen in modern sharks. This fin shape would have powered Stenopterygius's large body as it raced through the water in search of its next meal. One of the most interesting Stenopterygius fossils shows a mother giving birth, proving that ichthyosaurs like the dolphins of today, bore live young, and that the young were born tail first. Protosuchus is one of the earliest and most primitive relatives of living crocodiles. However, in many ways it was very different from living crocodiles. It walked with an almost upright stance, its limbs were long and slender, and its feet were thin and capped with claws. These features suggest that Protosuchus was a strong runner and adapted for hunting on land rather than in the water. However, like living crocodiles, it had a wide skull, powerful jaw muscles and thick, conical teeth. It is no surprise that Protosuchus possessed a mixture of primitive and more modern physical features because it lived toward the beginning of crocodilomorph evolutionary history. It was first found in Arizona but more recently its fossils have turned up in many other places across the world. Steniosaurus was unlike most modern crocodiles, it did not lurk around the edge of the water, but rather was a competent swimmer that could venture into estuaries and coastal waters to hunt fish. However, it was not fully aquatic, it still had a bony coat of armor and its limbs were not modified into flippers, this meant that it could hunt on land if necessary. Dacosaurus was the largest and fiercest member of a group of marine reptiles distantly related to modern crocodiles. This behemoth was much larger than the other marine reptiles that, along with fish, formed most of its diet. It was well adapted to life in the open oceans, with a streamlined body and paddle-like limbs. However, unlike many of its relatives, which had tubular snouts, it had a deep skull that resembled those of predatory dinosaurs such as Tyrannosaurus. Its teeth were also similar to those of theropods, as well as modern killer whales. They were large, narrow and covered with an array of sharp serrations, perfect for cutting flesh. Like Dacosaurus, Geosaurus is a member of the Metriorhynchids, a group of distinctive crocodilomorphs that lived in the open oceans. Unlike its land-living relatives, Geosaurus had lost its protective coat of bony scales, making its body lighter and more streamlined for swimming. In addition, its hands and feet had evolved into flippers, its body was thin and elongated, and its tail had a deep fin. There is even evidence that its skull housed a large salt gland, an organ present in some marine creatures that enables them to drink salty seawater and eat aquatic prey without dehydrating. A successful predator, it used its sharp teeth to plunder schools of fish and squid.